All right, it's two hours UTC, and it's When to Eat Chocolate, a guide for researchers by AaronScience.com. So this is just a schematic. It's a walkthrough to see when researchers, I assume like scientific researchers, should eat chocolate. So it begins with a question. How's your day? Well, if your answer is good, then you can sort of move, move down there and see that it says, well done, have a reward. And then it says, eat chocolate. Now, if the answer to your question, how's your day is bad, then there's an additional question that says, what happened? And a number of things you know, can, can happen uh, in a day to, to make it uh, bad, right? And for a researcher, these, these I would say, are you know, definitely the top four, right? Top four, not, not in any particular order, but these are definitely the top four, okay? Didn't get funding. That's, that would make your day bad. Uh, your experiment didn't work. That would definitely make your day bad. The lab is on fire. Yeah, that, that really sucks. It really sucks when that happens. And bureaucracy. So bureaucracy makes for a bad, a bad day. And so, you know, if, if you follow each of these uh, down, um, well, if you didn't get funding, that really sucks, but you'll therefore need um, energy, right? To write a new grant application. And really, you know, the only, the only real way to get that extra little energy boost that you're gonna need for that is to eat chocolate. So if your experiment didn't work, right? Well, then what you need to do, and I do this all the time, is, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily take a walk, but I pace, right? I get up out of my chair and I walk around and I, I rant and rave and, and you know, make all kinds of, uh, of um, you know, half sentence comments, trying, trying to think up a new way of doing things. And so what, what better excuse to, you know, walk to the store, walk to the shops, as they say, say here, and eat some chocolate. So if your lab is on fire, okay, well, it's a fact. I wouldn't say that you might be in shock. You are going to be in shock. And a good way to deal with that is you know, to keep your um, blood sugar up. Now, I'm not really into sugar bombs. So, so uh, you know, yeah, you got to keep your blood sugar up. There are other ways of, of doing that. But I guess I, I would say the, the most enjoyable way is to eat chocolate. And well, it's a fact that if you want to, you know, eliminate, uh, eliminate um, put, um, paperwork, right? Uh, well, uh, eating chocolate requires no paperwork whatsoever. So hey there, everybody, this is Cosmic and you're watching a live stream called Astronomy Daily Live. And I will pop, pop back in. I just saw that um, graphic just a couple of minutes ago on my um, Twitter feed. Let me, uh, let me give uh, all the recognition in the world. Um, this is uh, a Twitter account called um, Academics Say academic say, and it was, it was liked by um, 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 somebody that I follow named um, Jesse um, Christensen. 
So academics say I am not following right now, but I'm just looking at it now on my um, Linux machine where I have my Twitter feed running. And um, academics say um, has 280,000 followers and is following no one. So uh, everyone's a groupie in this one and they're calling it a social experiment. <clears throat> social experiment. They've tweeted uh, 4,405 times. So I'm gonna get on this train. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna get on this train. And there's also a link to Errant Science, which uh, says it's a Twitter account full of silly science comics and irreverent blog posts. So I am definitely into that kind of a thing as, as well. We need, you know, um, the, uh, the Joker in, in the um, Court of the King was what, you know, was, was there, you know, to provide entertainment, sure. But the Joker uh, was allowed to make any irreverent comment about the king or the kingdom or the subjects, anything, anything. The Joker, uh, at least my understanding is, is that you, um, the Joker was able to get away with pretty much anything because, you know, he was a little funny. And, and so it's like, you know, uh, entertaining, even, even, if, even if what the Joker was saying was true. <laughs> so it's okay so i'm going to follow both of those those guys i just saw that and and i'm a i'm a big um uh fan of chocolate uh always have been probably always will be and um it you know everything everything in moderation though you've got to find some some nice balance so you know don't don't be going overboard with chocolate or um, anything else, right? But I recommend the, the, the highest percent cacao that you can find and the least amount of sugar that you can uh, get. We eat way too much sugar. I, uh, about a year, um, almost a year and a half now, I'll tell you a story, non-astronomical story, okay? So uh, my apologies, but uh, um, uh, maybe about a year, not quite a year and a half ago, um, I, I, I didn't really pay any attention to when I um, started this, but I decided that I was going to eliminate what I call um, sugar bombs. And sugar bombs are just those foods that that you know have like added um, sugar. So so uh, you know, uh, it wasn't a thing where it's like you know I'm going to eliminate sugar because look, folks, these bodies operate on sugar. That that is our um, energy storage. That's our battery. Right. That's that's where we get all of the energy that um, we need to uh, operate. Right. So we need sugar. We need sugar. So but the cool thing is, is that sugar is everywhere. Sugar is pervasive, um, you know, not only in natural foods, you know, like like fruit and 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 nuts. Um, and uh, all of that, but it's also in you know the processed foods too, rice, flour, uh, uh, you know, any of those things. So you know we're we're inundated with um, sugar, and that's okay, that's okay. But then there's there's you know all these foods that are just excessively just sugar bombs. And, and uh, you know, they are everywhere and um, sugars are very, very, very um, 
um, addictive um, substance. And, and uh, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily call it bad. What I'm saying is, is that, is that too much is probably not a great thing. So, so, you know, in a normal diet, we get enough sugar to, to run things. Really don't need any more. And um, now I'm, I'm a pretty skinny guy um, to begin with. Um, but when I eliminated sugar bombs, which was basically, okay, some kind of donuts, um, uh, any of the, you know, really, really sugary candies and all that candy was gone. Um, just anything, you, you know, that sort of has either, either extra or like an excessive amount of sugar. Um, I, I just, uh, I, I suddenly found sort of, you know, very, very, um, um, distasteful and, uh, I lost, uh, as I said, I'm pretty skinny dude anyway, but I lost, um, I think I've lost a, in, in a little over a year, something like 20, um, 25 pounds or so. And I have not, I have not changed anything else. I still eat everything else. Oh, um, no sodas. Um, that was probably a big one. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, um, not a lot of, of, um, juices either. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll drink a smoothie from time to time, you know, like a fruit one. Um, but otherwise, you know, no juices, you know, no orange juice, no apple juice, um, nothing like, like that. Anyway, uh, uh, anyway, so my preference for chocolate is, you know, high, um, percentage of, cacao, 85% or higher, right? You have a little bit of fat in there. There is a little bit of excessive sugar in there. And, uh, um, you know, a lot of people don't, don't like it, right? Which, um, you know, as with everything else, not everything is for um, everyone. Otherwise, you know, it'd be a boring life, right? But uh, I find uh, um, that kind of chocolate to be extremely delicious, extremely rich, lots of interesting flavors. So I am a chocolate advocate. You know, maybe uh, a one or two inch square um, each day, perfectly fine. Maybe three or four, whatever. All right. Well, I hope everybody's doing doing well. As as you can see, this is just a fun, casual um, gathering of friends each and every day. Astronomy Daily Live. Let's see. Is there anybody in the chat? Nope. I don't see anybody in the chat. Um, and we talk about astronomical topics here each and every day at two hours UTC usually goes for between 30 and 60 minutes or so. I'm, I'm uh, trying, trying to keep these relatively short, not, not going excessively over, over an hour. But yeah, I'm trying to get into the, into the 30 to 45 minute time slot. So yeah, I hope everybody's doing, doing well. If you're new, haven't seen this live stream yet, Go over and uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's Cosmic Lettuce, and you can set um, notifications there so you can be notified when this is going on live next time. As I said, this is happening every single day at two hours UTC. I've got coffee tonight. Look at that. Cheers. Let's see. All right, cool. So um, I was watching the weekly space hangout today, just just uh, maybe uh, hours or so ago, and uh, M Morgan was pretty harsh 
he was pretty harsh on every scope. Um, I don't know where that's coming from, if that's coming from a point of sort of ignorance, but uh, he was he was very, uh, you know, uh, not not too nice, not too nice things to say about um, every scope, uh, uh, you know, calling it a MacGyvering of sorts. That's uh, that's a little harsh. That's a wee bit harsh, especially for um, every scope. Uh, you know, and maybe I'm a little bit biased because I've been following this um, project for a number of years now, and and uh, I I find it to be absolutely awesome. My only number one complaint, and sorry that I've uh, frozen up on the live stream here a little bit, must be having ISP problems. Oh well, life will go on. Um, uh, t -t 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 what was I talking about? Arr, I was thinking about coffee. Mm. Morgan being a little bit harsh on um, the every scope. You know, they're they're actually doing science with that data. They're they're producing scientific results. You can go read their papers. So uh, I think. You know, maybe he was generalizing a little bit. I'm not quite sure where where that uh, attitude has come from. Um, uh, so yeah, that was sort of a curious reaction. I thought. Um, you know, I I want to say that it's a, it's a it's an action out of um, ignorance, but I I would think that 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 may be the case. He doesn't seem to be the type to just sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, dump whatever uh, is lying at the top of his his head, sort of, regardless of, of not researching it or, or not. So, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, one of those things, I guess. Um, Everybody, uh, you know, can have an opinion, and uh, I just, you know, if if Morgan watches this, which I doubt, uh, or you know, if any of you folks can let him know that I've I've made a little comment on on his comments, um, I encourage him to check out every scope because it's uh, it's a it's a really great project. It it is um, legit. It is definitely not a MacGyvering thing where you um, 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 tape together, you know, some telescopes and some cameras, and uh, as he said, um, put them out in the Arizona desert. So I thought that was an interesting reference. <laughs> so um, yeah, all right, all right. Off of that one, I'm. Uh, let's do another sip of coffee here. Cheers. Yeah, I think I'm definitely having uh, some ISP slowdown things. My uh, my smartphone has just gone into pause mode, so it's it's not. Uh, I'm gonna try to reload it. See if that. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're back. Yeah. It's just one of those nights, I guess. So let's see. Um, it is 218 UTC. I'm just trying to decide where I want to go with this. There's another survey telescope that has come online and they have just released, I don't exactly know when, but they've just released sort of their early, I think they're calling it an early release date where they have a few, uh, a few, um, images out a little bit of data out and so i'm going to share my screen again and go to my discord channel where i was um, and we're going to go down here to papers i'm going to hide that it's called j plus j plus
Yeah, my internet connection here is very, very slow. So these look like some Spanish folks. The Havalimbre Photometric Local Universe Survey. And um, so let's just take a quick look at this. And then maybe we'll do an object of the day and then and then we'll uh we'll we'll call it yeah let's see i'm gonna pull up my uh my chat again slow load look at this slow load <laughs> Lots of authors. Wow, you know, Tom um, um, posted a, a paper over on my um, over on my um, Discord server as as well about about a magnetar that has just sort of turned back on. And uh, holy moly, there were a lot of authors on that one too. But look at look at all the authors here. Just amazing. So. A plus is going to be looking at the sky in the optical band, so in the visible band, as they say. Mm, excuse me. Hey, now, come on. So 12, 12 optical bands, 12 different colors, as you can call them. Um, using a camera that is going to see a two square degree field of view mounted on an 83 centimeter, that's a 32 inch um, telescope. Um, so looking at the entire um, visible range and yeah, you know, a little bit beyond that in, in, both, in both directions. The sort of the normal human eye can see maybe 4,000 to 9,000, something like that. You know, 4,000 being extremely violet, just, you know, the, the darkest of, of violet and 9,000 being sort of the darkest of, of red. So, yeah, you know, this covers um, the visible range for, for sure and dives a little, little tiny bit into the ultraviolet and a little, little, little tiny bit into the infrared. So that's that's very, very cool. Um, uh, let's see, and and then, you know, sort of um, um, specific filters to sort of, you know, the standard um, um, calcium H and K bands, the G band, which is nice, um, the, um, um, magnesium B and um, calcium um, triplets. So yeah, you know, just sort of your standard um, photometric bands. Um, and yeah, hopefully uh, this data is going to be available for us to uh, look at. They, uh, they talked a little bit about, you know, their motivations for doing this. And uh, kind of two um, motivations I've, I've um, pulled out of um, looking at this sort of in a brief way. One is that, okay, you know, everybody else is doing it and they're doing it really, really well. So let's, let's do it too. So that's very, very cool. It's a me too type of a thing. Um, but I guess what they're up to is this larger survey, which they're calling JPAS, J-P-A-S, which is gonna be, be using a 2.5 meter telescope. So, you know, quite a bit more, let's say point, point 0.82, I'm gonna grab my handy dandy calculator here. Um, let's do this in square meters, okay? So 0.82 diameter, gotta divide that by two to get the radius. That's 0.41 meters. So the area in meters is pi r squared. So I'm going to square that. 
and then I'm going to multiply it by pi, and we get 0.528 square meters. So that's what they are working with right now, is 0.528 square meters. Uh, minus probably a secondary mirror. I think this was uh, like a Ritchie Cretan um, scope. So, uh, so yeah, you know, there's going to be an obscuration in the middle as as well. Probably, ooh, probably at least 10%, if not more. Uh, this is a very, very, very fast um, mirror. I think it's like f4.5. So it's, uh, yeah, I think it's got this huge secondary mirror. Let's, let's cheat and move ahead and we'll look at the actual, uh, yeah, okay. So the effective collecting area, as they're saying here, is 0.44 square meters. Okay, so that's uh, 0.44 divided by 0.528, so 80, 83 percent. Uh, we can do this this way. I can add one. So about, yeah, about 17 percent of the total area is obscured by um, um, the secondary mirror. So what I, where I was going with that was let's just see how much bigger uh, the 2.5 meter is. So 2.5, half of that is 1.25. Oh, we're going to square that and then multiply it by pi. So that's almost five square meters. So we're talking a factor of 10 in area. And a factor of 10 in area, right? You divide that by 2.5. That's a factor of four magnitudes. Uh, so they'll be able to see four magnitudes fainter with this um, um, 2.5 meter telescope. And the field of view is uh, more than twice the area as, as well. So they're getting 10 times the collecting area and uh, uh, more than a factor of two larger um, imaging area. So, so uh, yeah, so I guess this is just what they're doing now with J plus is just sort of it's sort of a practice run for J pass. And I don't know anything about this, but they say that the main scientific driver of J pass is the measurement of the radial baryonic acoustic oscillations. So I have absolutely no idea what baryonic acoustic oscillations are. Um, so as I say, you know, every, every paper like this is a jumping off point to learning learning more than than just what this paper is talking about and here's a perfect example of that it's like i have no idea what baryonic acoustic oscillations are so but uh yeah i think that's pretty awesome pretty pretty awesome all right well cool let's uh let's move on here um uh, let's see. So yeah, it's a German equatorial mount. It's, it is a Ritchie Cretan, um, blah, 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 F4.5, 55.56 arc seconds per millimeter. So that's pretty cool. Nice camera. Heavy, heavy telescope though, 2,500 kilograms, woohoo, monster, there it is, there it is. So as, as you can see, this is a very, very, very fast, very fast thing. It's got a huge secondary mirror there. And I guess there's, uh, there's their camera on the back of it too. Very cool. Observatorio Astrofisico de Havalimbre. 
quite sure where that is. So here, is, okay, so here's just a diagram of the camera and what it looks like when it's mounted on the, on the scope. Big camera, right? It's almost um, 10K by 10K, 0.55 arc seconds per pixel. So that's pretty good sampling. You know, you're you can expect uh, one or one and a half, two arc second seeing. So, you know, you're sampling that, that pretty well. It takes 12 seconds um, um, to read out one, one image. Doesn't say the, uh, at least in this little, little table here, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't say if it's a 16 bit or a 12 bit or a 24 bit, don't know. I assume it's at least a 16 bit. So here's all the filters that are going to be used with their corresponding central wavelength and bandwidth. So the main goals of J plus is to provide reliable stellar SEDs, SED. Uh, I don't know what an SED is. Can we look back and find out what an SED is? What's an SED? All this terminology, you know, drives me insane. SED. What? What is this? What is this? I'm just doing a simple search here. SED. Uh, oh, I don't know what an SED is. The use of narrowband filters makes JPAS to be equivalent to low resolution integral field unit of the northern sky, providing the SED of every pixel of the sky, ultimately a 3D. Oh, I don't know what SED is. Oh, yeah, that sucks. Sorry about that. That's how it goes. Nice scope though, nice scope, hope it works. So there's all your filters, right? Different scientific filters. To look, just, just to look at your targets with different wavelengths of light tells you tells you a lot about the objects that you're um, looking at not quite as good as spectroscopy right but a pretty simple thing to just you know basically you know look through some colored glass and be able to pick out different um, features that you normally wouldn't be able to pick out so it's very very cool And they're covering it in 12 different bands. So they've made a very, very cool, colorful graphic here showing each, each of the wavelengths, U, G, R, I, and Z, and then all those in between. And then they've colorized them here, here too. Also showing, um, I assume, let's see, including the effect of the entire system. Okay, so, so uh, you know, at its best, right, at its peak, it's only 60% efficient. So, you know, you, you're losing a lot of light when you run through these um, filters. But, uh, you know, as long as you calibrate that away, no problem. No problem at all. It's a little bit of um, overlap, which is usually a good thing. But they're showing, you know, some narrow band filters here and some wide band f filters as, as well. Just, you know, they want to cover both wide band and narrow band. These are sort of the interesting wavelengths, right? It's where, where things are happening, magnesium and calcium, 
uh, yeah. So limiting magnitude in each of the filters, yeah, it does look like it's gonna be around 21, 22, something like that, very cool. I didn't, uh, I didn't see where they were doing like exposure time. Oh, here, here it is. Exposure times of J plus are set to reach the required signal to noise at approximately 18th magnitude. Since J plus fields are observed at different moon phases and moon distances, the optimal exposure time will depend on the brightness of the sky. So for this reason, during commissioning, we have empirically modeled the dependence of sky brightness with respect to both distance and phase of the moon. The estimated sky brightness at every J plus pointing is then given as input to the exposure time calculator, which determines the particular exposure time for that pointing in time. So given the change in background, uh, observing at, uh, um, in the 12 filters takes typically about 35 minutes of dark time and about one and a half hours in bright time. So yeah, to take one set of images for each of the 12, uh, hello, Susan O'Hare, um, takes about 35 minutes just, just for one set of um, filters. But you know, it's a nice wide field of view and uh, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So that answers my question about that. Let's see, with, with the goal of, of, of observing the same, an 8,500 square degree uh, in the footprint of J-Pass, J-plus is scheduled in 4,250 pointings. For the most immediate observations, three priority areas have been selected. Uh, priority uh, north number one. Um, okay, so looking um, right ascension 120 degrees to 180 degrees. So that puts it um, in terms of hours, 120 divided by 15. So from eight hours to 12 hours, eight hours to 12 hours, and 30 degrees positive to 42. So that's just a narrow, a narrow band in um, declination. Um, so north number two priority is 180 to 245. So that's uh, 12 hours to 16 and a third hours, and then 47 to 57. And then there's a southern one, zero degrees to 42.2 and negative five to, uh, to eight. So I'm just wondering, 42.2 divided by 15. Yeah, so, you know, they're avoiding, they're avoiding the um, galactic plane because they don't, they don't want all those stars. But yeah, you know, they're overlapping with other surveys which is nice because you want to be able, you know, just like, um, just like in the, uh, uh, um, just like in the uh, work I'm doing, uh, I, I want to compare my results to, to others to see how close they are. And if I trust those other surveys, then I can trust mine. And that's exactly what they're doing here as well. So let's see. Get into photometric calibration. I'm not going to get into that much. I just wanted to alert you and show you. Okay, so I guess this is the early data release. With the final J plus strategy in depths frozen, we have identified and curated a subset of J plus uh, tiles that uh, are. Um, representative of the J plus project in terms of depth, PSF, photometric calibration, accuracy, et cetera. So they have um, sent this out. Here are, here are the links down here. So I'm definitely going to check that data out, um, see what can be done with that stuff. So let's see, EDR comprises 18 J plus 
coinings amounting to 31.7 square degrees. Cool. I'm definitely going to check check these guys out. The interesting thing that I noticed, you know, uh, if if you've been following this live stream, I've been talking about a project that I'm I'm working on to to sort of characterize my and CCD um, system and and uh, um, measuring um, the astrometry, um, doing astrometry, which is measuring the um, positions of targets. And I'm also doing um, photometry, which is measuring the brightnesses of, of targets. And I want my accuracy and precision to be as, as small as it possibly can. Um, meaning that um, um, good accuracy means that I'm getting the right answer. And good precision means that I'm consistently getting the right answer. So, so uh, I want both of those things. In terms of um, photometry, I'm, I'm actually aiming for like a tenth of a magnitude. Um, the, and my very, very um, preliminary results was some data that I took uh, on the evening of March 15th or so with some pretty bad seeing and just a little bit of data, I'm getting about, about a third of a magnitude um, accuracy, which, you know, isn't really all that great. It's, uh, you know, depending on the brightness of, of the star, that's an accuracy of, you know, three, four, five, six percent or so, which eh, isn't, you know, I don't really think is all that, all, all that great. But, um, and, you know, maybe I'm reading this, or my initial interpretation of this chart that I've got shown up here was a little premature. But as you can see, oh, I'm pointing with the wrong uh, pointer here. This, this value called sigma, that is the Greek letter sigma. I'm going to zoom in here so you can see a little bit better. See this? It looks like an O with a little tail on it, like that. That is the Greek letter sigma, and that's that's a a common mathematical uh, term for um, measurement of accuracy. And they're getting about a third of a magnitude as well. About a third of a magnitude. Whoop! I'm going to zoom out a little bit because I zoomed in too much. Poor machine is being slow tonight too. Um, but they're getting about a third of a magnitude. Also, you see all these are 0.3. Here's a 0.2. Here's a 0.5 in the G. Now G is uh, is actually the wavelength that I'm looking at. So uh, that's that's kind of interesting. 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 again, something like that. But 0.5 magnitudes with a uh, limiting magnitude of 22.3 divided by 22.3. That's a, okay, well, you know, that's 2% that's accuracy. That's 2% that's accuracy. So, you know, if, if these guys are happy with 2% accuracy, then I'm going to say that I'm pretty happy with my 4% accuracy, um, given at least you know, the conditions that I, I had and you know, the limited amount of data that I have. Um, I think that's, I'm, I'm sort of re-evaluating my, uh, my uh, uh, opinion on, on how good my um, photometry is. And uh, now I'm even a little bit more excited to see this new um, um, set of data. Um, oh, Susan, surveys are like all the rage now, okay? Back, back in the early 90s, okay? Um, um, institutions were, were contemplating mothballing, you know, just 
putting aside, tearing down um, observatories, you know, telescopes, 40 inch telescopes, uh, you know, and all, all these different size, size scopes and everything. And, and I, I was one of the ones that was yelling at the top of my lungs. It's like, don't, don't, what, a, you know, do something with them. If, if nothing else, right, if nothing else, just point them at the sky and watch things happen. And, uh, you know, at the time it was sort of like, ah, wah, 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 you know, nothing happens up there, blah, blah, blah. Well, it turns out that a lot of stuff happens all the time on um, um, different time scales, um, um, different um, parts of the sky, et cetera, et cetera. So, so um, surveys are now all the rage. And this is just one of, of many. So, um, and as I said, you know, their motivation is that they, they have set, set this system up to sort of practice for a bigger survey that they want to do uh, later. But so, you know, given the fact that they're, that they seem to be pretty happy with, you know, two or three percent photometry, well, maybe I should be happy with that too. I mean, I'm, I'm aiming for 1% or, or less. And uh, yeah, I don't know, you know, as I said, I've looked at one set of data where I know that the seeing isn't all that great and I've got a pretty small sample. So, you know, I'm not gonna be able to get, you know, the accuracy and um, precision um, statistically speaking, that I really want. So, but if these guys are happy with half a magnitude, uh, I should be happy with that too, right? Here's just a sample image pointing out a few targets. I'll zoom out one more time here. So 1.41 degrees on each side. And that does work out to be two square degrees because 1.41 squared squared is, yep, 1.98 or 1.99. So that's two square degrees there. And uh, yeah, you know, depending on what, what wavelength you look, you're you're looking uh you know to a depth of about 21st magnitude or so that's not bad there's just some scientific data the this is a a image of the same galaxy ngc 4470 in this case i'm just reading you know the figure caption here taken at the 12 different wavelength bands. And as you can see, you know, depending on, and, you know, this goes back to my whole spiel about, you know, perspective, you know, having different perspectives on things, um, not only, you know, um, uh, um, you know, gives you a different view of things, it provides you with different kinds of information as as well so you know if you look at at this um galaxy in the u band here you see certain features right but if you look at it in j0660 well you can see that there are that there is a similarity in features see there's these two here and there's these two here and here's this little spiral arm thing here and this little spiral arm there but you know these these are much clearer these are much more sharply defined um there's a lot more fuzz right there's a lot more fuzz in this image than there is in in this one and that's just because we are looking at it 
uh, at a slightly different um, wavelength. So we're just looking at different stuff, right? Looking at different stuff. So this is very exciting. You know, most of the survey things are, as I said, you know, this is just one of many, but hey, I get pretty excited with survey things. I think the more data we have access to, uh, the better. So, you know, they talk a little bit about uh, some science that can be done. Um, I didn't really get deep into this, so I'm just going to zoom, zoom through it from here on out. Photospectral white dwarf. Cool. See, so um, these are the 12 wavelength bands that they can look at objects with. Overlaid is a spectrum of a white dwarf star so you can sort of see you know how those two things relate right photometry um is just a little bit simpler to do but spectroscopy gives you a lot more um, information but it's a completely different configuration <laughs> so it's hard to do both at the same time although that can be done but you can see that the photometry does sort of follow the spectrum pretty well. When, when the spectrum is low, uh, the photometry is low. And when the spectrum is high, like this spike, the photometry is high. So not bad, not bad. These, these little uh, lines here, those are called error bars. So this, this is a measurement of their accuracy, right? So they, you know, because it's a calculating machine, they do actually come up with some number, right? And that's what that dot um, um, represents. But because, I'm gonna sneeze. <coughs> uh, but because um, the measurements vary, um, you get this, this, this range. So this is just like a range. So this value can actually be anywhere from here to here, right? So that's a pretty big error bar. This is a really small error bar, right? Here's another big one over here. Here's sort of a medium one. So that's just sort of how to, how to read, read these things. You can see that the error bars here are all very, very small. Typically, the error bars go up and down depending on like how bright um, the target is, how many photons you can actually collect. I'm um, going way over time again. It's just way too cool. Not bad, you know, it's a good match. It's a good match. Uh, redshift bias, not quite sure what redshift bias is. Here's another image. I think this is M101 the galaxy the one thing that i noticed here let's let's zoom in here a little bit let's see if it'll give me the time of day to do that the one thing that i noticed that sort of is a little bit disturbing to me because i'm a i'm a optics guy too when i see stars that look like that I'm, see, this, this pattern is actually in everything in this image, right? So you can see it in this star up here. You can't really see it in the fuzzy things because it's sort of blurred out. It's sort of spread out. But with these point sources, you can really see that there's, that's, I mean, that's, ah, come on. That's, uh, that's some uh, pretty, pretty bizarre looking distortion. So, and uh, regardless of whether you can see it in this or not, it's there, it's there. It is messing up that, that image. It's messing with, you know, the data. And uh, so that kind of bothers me a little bit. Um, I really would like to see their, their actual, you know, raw data, you know, to see what's going on there because it looks like they've been doing 
some post processing that uh, is really messing up um, the images. Good picture though, good color, you know, for for what um, color is is worth. They see they've got twelve different wavelength bands, so they can choose three of those and call one red, one green, and one blue. Um, 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 combine them and make um, pictures. And they can do that for all combinations of three with all 12 um, um, filters. That's some of the things that I like to do is sort of mess with those colors um, and see what can be seen. So pretty interesting. This is, this is some funny looking stuff though, single bright pixels. I don't know. I don't know. All right. Well, look, I think I'm going to get out of here for now. I'm really trying to keep this be from to a time between 30 and 45 minutes. And here we are almost on the hour. Uh, why aren't I? I broadcasting get out of here. Come back on to here, screen share, cancel. There. I'm going to get out of here for now because I deeply respect your time. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for watching. And we will do this all again in about 23 hours or so. So cheers. Hope you like that. We will definitely be back together, back into the circle of friends for a casual, fun, get together, sit around, um, talk astronomy, talk astronomical things for a little while. Forget the TV, forget the news. Let's think about the universe. It's a, it, it's a very exciting place. And uh, I invite you all in. All right. I will see you on the spin tomorrow. Okay. Bye.